All right, welcome everybody. Uh, we're gonna be talking about the Lightning Network today. H how many people uh, own, use Bitcoin at all, yeah? Uh, has anybody used Lightning before? Yeah. Yeah, okay, awesome. Uh, are you familiar at all with it? Like what, what sort of level of experience are we talking about? Not at all? Okay, fantastic. I'm gonna be bas basically going over uh, fairly high level. We're gonna start with very simple examples and sort of drill down into uh, more detail, more detail, more detail, sort of figuring out how it basically works, how we can have trustless payments off chain. That's, that's really the challenge of the Lightning Network. First off though, has anyone ever heard of the Hawala Network? So it's been in operation for about 1,200 years. And when I say it has been in operation, that is current. It is still going. It is a trust network across the globe, mainly focused in the Middle East. Um, but the basic idea is uh, you, you have uh, these people called uh, Hawaladars that you want to send money to your friend in another city. You go to your local Hawaladar, say, hey, I am going to send uh, you know, money to my friend in Mecca. And uh, they're going to have a password, say, you know, Bob is cool. And so the Hawaladar says, great, I'll let my, know, let my, my fellow Hawaladar in Mecca know that somebody will be coming in with the password, Bob is cool, and uh, we will give them your money. And you know, they take a fee for the service. Um, and then these two Hawaladars just sort of update their own balance sheet between them. They say, okay, well, you know, this guy brought in $500, you know, plus fees, whatever, and uh, you paid out that much, so I owe you this much. And so they just do a whole bunch of these transactions, and at the end of the year, they settle up. And if you can imagine 1,200 years ago, when people are mainly transacting in, say, gold, gold is very slow. You have to take it in wagons with a whole lot of security. And so you're not going to do these you know, frequent transactions. You're going to want to bundle them all together, right? And so that's what the Hawala network is for. Um, I, I'm sure that over time, they have changed how they communicate and update their things. I would like to think that at some point, it was carrier falcons. And uh, no one has proven me wrong, so I'm going to continue to believe that. Carrier Falcon Network. I love the Huala Network. So the, the fun thing is, it is still operating today outside a traditional banking system, which means it's illegal a lot of places because you start doing things outside of the traditional banking system. It's very difficult to track. It's an anonymous thing. Uh, and the, it's, it's funny, the, uh, the example I found, you know, somebody in the US sending money to their family in India. Uh, I think it's actually illegal in both the US and India, even though I think it started in India. Um, but yeah, so if you understand how the Hawala network works, you understand how the Lightning Network works. OK, so what is the Lightning Network? Uh, it is an open protocol and global trustless network. Uh, we'll see a map in a minute. It's more focused in the US and Europe, but there are nodes all over the world. But the thing is that it is a trustless network that is backed by the Bitcoin blockchain. And it allows for cross-payment, instant settlement, and streaming micropayments, things that are difficult to do on chain. You know, you have a blockchain, we'll be going over in a second, you know, some of the, the drawbacks to using Bitcoin payments on chain, uh, but you, you can't do you know, little tiny payments because it's, it's too expensive. You can't do instant payments because you need to wait for block confirmations. Um, uh, how many people have you know, been in the situation where uh, you're out with friends, you're trying to split up you know, payment for tickets or something, and you have to ask around, it's like, okay, are we, doing, are we doing Cash App? Are we doing Venmo? Are we doing PayPal? Who has what apps? The idea of the Lightning Network is it is an open protocol so that they can actually just interoperate without needing to have you know, the exact same app. Um, so that's, that's kind of the, uh, the application that we're talking about for this. Right now, it's not very big. There are about 14,000 nodes globally, 56,000 channels. Only about 5,000 Bitcoin are actually locked up in it. So, you know, quarter billion dollars which, you know, given the market cap of Bitcoin just broke a trillion again, it's, it's not all that much, but it's a growing thing. Um, right now, approximate transaction costs, there are two parts to it. Uh, there's a base fee that you, you know, make a payment, uh, you're gonna be charged base fee of probably about one Satoshi, which is 1 20th of a penny. 
uh, and then fee rates, depending on uh, how much you are transferring, uh, that is all the way up to 0.0083%. So you can tell this is a very expensive way to uh, send money around. Um, okay, so this is rough visualization of at least what is pu publicly visual, uh, visible right now. Um, you can have you know, nodes on Tor, you can have private channels. Not all of it is actually visible to people in general. Uh, and I'm guessing that they put some filtering on this. I'm pretty sure there are not 14,000 nodes visible on this map. But you can see that it's, it's fairly concentrated in the US and Europe, but you've got connections all over the globe. So why the Lightning Network? Why are we doing it this way? Uh, if you have made transactions on Bitcoin, you know that you need to wait for block confirmations. And uh, on average, anytime you submit a uh, transaction to the network, it's going to be an average of 10 minutes before that gets confirmed. And if you want to really make sure that it is solidly there, then you got to wait for a couple more confirmations on that. So, you know, half an hour to an hour to be really sure that your transfer has totally gone through. Uh, standard Bitcoin transactions also require mining fees. You know, people are expending an awful lot of energy to mine these blocks, and the block subsidy cuts in half every four years. So over time, there's going to be a lot more reliance on transaction fees. And uh, if anybody tried to make some transactions while the recent ordinal craze was going, when there's a lot of demand for block space, it can get kind of expensive to make on-chain transactions, which if you think about what you're doing, you're writing a record to a you know, permanent uh, place in the blockchain that is going to be preserved for all of eternity. And if you're buying a cup of coffee, that probably doesn't need to be on-chain. So the whole idea of the Lightning Network is how do we do these transactions that are backed by the security of this you know, enormous pool of power mining all the time, but we don't need to do it in a way that uh, is super inefficient. So Lightning is a layer two protocol or a globally decentralized network that uh, lets you do instant off-chain trustless payments backed by Bitcoin. Um, there are only two transactions that actually have to happen for a Lightning channel. You have to make a transaction that opens the channel, and you have to make a transaction to close the channel. And between those two points, you can have any number of transactions going back and forth on that channel, uh, and, and it's not going to have any impact on chain. So what are we talking about with layer two? Um, Think about the internet. The internet is built in layers. Um, you've got HTTP is its own thing built on top of TCP, which is built on top of IP, which is on top of the physical infrastructure. And the idea of doing it in these layers means that you can have innovation at a higher level that doesn't impact, you know, you're not introducing bugs in TCP when you make some updates to what's available in HTTP. So you can have different things built on different layers and develop them somewhat independently of each other. So the idea here is uh, we don't want to mess with the base layer of Bitcoin. There's a very delicate balance that Satoshi set with you know, how uh, we actually secure value there. And you know, there are, what, like 20,000 altcoins out there that are trying their own variations on those trade-offs. Uh, but right now, Bitcoin is the most successful in, you know, the particular balance that it has struck. So how do you maintain that? Don't jeopardize that, but still get the benefits that you could get from you know, some other approach. So layer two means that we kind of get to uh, have our cake and eat it too. There are also multiple different implementations of Lightning. They're uh, similar to how uh, Bitcoin has BIPs, uh, Bitcoin improvement proposals. Uh, Lightning has bolts that um, different people can make their own implementations of Lightning following the, uh, the, the, the general protocol that uh, other people have agreed on. And uh, you don't need to be reliant on one set implementation. Uh, different implementations have you know, some different features like right at the cutting edge than you know, maybe uh, C Lightning 
Uh, I'm, I'm trying to remember specific examples. I'm just going to pretend like, you know, C Lightning implemented dual funded channels first and, you know, figured out how to make that work and then, uh, you know, LND caught up with that. And I'm completely making that up. That has no factual basis. Don't quote me on that. Um, but that's, that's basically what we're talking about. You can have different implementations doing slightly different things. So when we're talking about Lightning Network, these are the big sort of concepts that we're going to be talking about. Nodes are very central to it. Nodes are a particular entity on the Lightning Network. Um, and nodes can be connected with channels. And channels are bi-directional payment channels between nodes. And as I mentioned, you can open a channel, which is a on-chain commitment of funds. So basically, uh, two nodes come together and say, OK, we are going to share uh, this particular transaction output, uh, it's called a UTXO, unspent transaction output, that we both need to sign on in order to spend. And so uh, then updating the channel is basically they both agree, OK, we're going to make a new transaction that we're not going to broadcast, but either one of us could at any time. And that's just going to update. This is the state of the channel. And it's, it's how are we going to spend this shared output that we have created. And then when you actually close the channel, that is you have published the commitment transaction that you have right now. And so it actually gets committed to chain. And uh, you, the nodes go their happy separate ways and spend the funds however they want. Routing. Uh, routing is basically if you have nodes that don't have direct channels with each other, how do they send money to each other? And so it's sort of a, a chain connection of payments through the network to go from you know, point A to point C through point B or you know, many more. Uh, and fees, mostly I'm going to glaze over fees, either mining fees or uh, lightning fees, uh, just to, to focus on how this can be trustless, rather than you know this is a full breakdown of the op codes that you're going to see in these commitment transactions. So uh, fees, it's going to be a combination of a base fee and a fee rate, um, which is determined by channel. Two nodes open in a channel together can basically set, these are the fees that we want to have when we transact with each other on this channel. So when I'm talking about nodes, it's going to be, you know, you got your Alice, you got your Bob. Uh, our, our blue boxes are going to be nodes. And uh, Alice and Bob each have, you know, say 50,000 Satoshis that they want to bring together to put in a lightning channel so they can, you know, trustlessly transact with each other back and forth however they want without needing to make commitments on chain. So I'm going to have a lot of diagrams that have a very simplified Bitcoin transaction structure. Um, I don't know how familiar people are with how Bitcoin transactions are actually structured, but we're going to focus on a high level that you basically you have a set of inputs that are references to unspent outputs from some other transaction. And uh, then you have a set of outputs that are creating new unspent outputs from the funds that you're bringing in from the inputs. And uh, in order to spend an output, there's uh, something called a script pub key, which is basically a locking script that's attached to the output. And if you're going to spend it as an input, you have to provide what's called a script sig, which is an unlock script that combines with the script pub key that means that you can use this output as an input in another transaction. Uh, we're going to ignore a whole lot of things like change outputs, where you know you are not spending the entire UTXO and you're sending some of it back to an address that you control. We're going to ignore mining fees. Uh, you know, in reality, there's going to be a discrepancy between the sum of all of the inputs used and the sum of all the outputs used, and that discrepancy is paid back to whatever miner includes this transaction in a block. So it's how you incentivize miners to actually mine your block, your uh, your transaction. Uh, we're also going to ignore SegWit, even though SegWit is absolutely integral to how the Lightning Network works. I'll touch very briefly on the one part of that that you know SegWit made it possible. But uh, largely, we're going to ignore a lot of the low-level details, and we're just going to focus on, you know, how is it that we can do this trustlessly? Yeah. When you say miners, are you talking about what we understand as proof-of-work mining? Yes, exactly. Yeah, so miners who are producing blocks that get attached to the blockchain, and largely the Lightning Network is meant to work around them. So you just have the, the one commitment transaction and the one closing transaction that have to actually be mined, and then all the other payments that you don't have to worry about dealing with miners. So 
Uh, here's a, a very simple example of what's called a dual funded transaction. Um, you have dual funded transactions where both parties bring UTXOs to the table. More common are single funded transactions, which are a lot simpler to implement, but I'm going to stick with dual funded because it's a lot easier for our purposes. So uh, let's say both Alice and Bob have 50,000 Satoshis, uh, which that's right now about 25 bucks each, that they want to combine into a channel of 100,000 Satoshis that uh, this two of two multi-sig means both Alice and Bob need to sign the transaction for it to be valid. Um, and that output is going to be used as an input into their first commitment transaction. And their very first commitment transaction doesn't actually do anything. You can see that we have an output paying 50,000 Satoshis to Alice and 50,000 Satoshis to Bob. Uh, so this is the part where SegWit's important because you actually want to make your commitment transaction first because you don't want to commit a transaction on chain that you are tied into, you know, you and Bob have to agree to spend this because what if Bob disappears? Then you just have, you know, your money is just locked on chain and you can't do anything with it. So first you get your exit plan. You know, we're going to make this commitment transaction, we're going to sign it, and then we're going to make our uh, funding transaction, sign that and publish it to chain. And that's the part that SegWit made possible because you have to know the transaction ID of the output that you're using as an input. And before SegWit, you couldn't know that before it was signed. So in order to do this trustlessly, you had to separate the witness data from the actual transaction. And that's as nerdy as I'm going to get. OK, so Alice and Bob have made their channel. And Alice wants to send 10,000 Satoshis to Bob. What does that look like on a Lightning channel? So that means that they update their commitment transaction. You can see that we have our initial commitment transaction, 50,000 each, and then they agree, I'm going to send you 10,000 Satoshis. So we take 10,000 Satoshis out of my output, put it in your output, sign that transaction, and how near we have a new commitment transaction that has updated the state of our channel. Who can see the flaw in this? How do you hack this? Publish the old one. It still exists. You know, Alice can say, hey, I want to buy a cup of coffee. Here's five bucks. Send 10,000 Satoshis to Bob, you know, update that. And then she goes ahead and publishes the original commitment transaction. And so she gets her money back. So how do we fix that? I'm going to be skipping over this level of detail. Mostly we're going to go back to seeing commitment transactions that look like this. But in reality, they each have their own commitment transaction that is slightly different. So the commitment transaction that Alice has uh, doesn't pay directly to her. It pays to her with a delay of some number of blocks. And uh, that can also be spent by Bob if he has what's called a revocation key. Um, and the revocation key, when they update their commitment transaction, they exchange the information necessary to know the revocation key of the previous state. And so as soon as you update this and exchange your revocation keys, we have a situation that if Alice tries to publish an old state, it's going to go on chain. Bob's going to see it go on chain. He says, hey, that's not what we agreed on. And then he can use his revocation key to spend that output. And she has to wait for however many blocks that delay sets before she can actually spend it. And so he's got a window of opportunity to take everything. So she is very strongly disincentivized from trying to cheat. You had a question? Yes, this publication you're talking about is directly on the blockchain. Right? Directly on the blockchain, yeah. We're not talking about the inside the Lightning Network. It's actually the public. Yeah, so if, if she decides that she's going to force close, so there, there are two ways to close a channel. There's a force close where you just publish one of these commitment transactions that has the revocation key in it. Uh, you can also do a cooperative close, which is you know, much more common, where you say, hey, it's been great. Let's close our channel. And then you make one final update to the commitment transaction, which takes you know, these commitment transactions that look like this, make them actually look like this. Make it that simple. So she is actually able to spend her stuff right away, because that's never going to be an old transaction. They're, they're done. And so they can you know, make it simple and then go ahead and publish that. And both can spend their stuff immediately. But this is, this is the, the trade-off. This is the balance. It says, if you try to cheat or if, you know, if Bob disappears, if Bob just disappears and we can't make any more updates, we can't do a cooperative close, then she can go ahead and 
publish the most recent commitment transaction, and then wait for the delay. Bob doesn't have the revocation key, so he can't spend it because it's the most recent one. Um, and so she just needs to wait for whatever delay they agreed on when they opened the channel. And then she gets her funds out, and uh, Bob can spend his if he ever comes back. What's the typical delay? Uh, it, it varies. Like, it might be 144 blocks if you want 24 hours. I think it can be up to uh, 216 blocks for two weeks. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure of what is assumed to be typical. Um, and we'll, we'll talk about uh, the idea of watchtowers a little bit later, because what if you know, your node goes down? You, know, you lose internet connection, and you are disconnected, and you can't see if Bob tries to, you know, Alice or Bob try to, try to cheat the system. And you basically have a, another node set up that you've made an agreement with that has enough information to identify if somebody's trying to cheat and do something about it on your behalf. A true blockchain node or a lightning node? A lightning node, yeah. Uh, Lightning nodes are reliant on blockchain nodes, so you know it, it will have you know a full node. But uh, yeah, Lightning node, good question. Okay, we're going to go back to ignoring revocation keys. At any point, just assume that if we have updated our commitment transaction, that there's been an exchange of revocation keys to make it a very bad idea to try to cheat the system. Okay, so let's talk about payments when you don't have a direct channel. Let's say Alice wants to send Bob ten thousand satoshis. Uh, and they don't have a channel together. But Alice has a channel with Carol, and Carol also has a channel with Bob. So Alice can say, hey, Carol, if I send you 10,000 Satoshis, will you send those on to Bob? And Carol says, yeah, sure, I'll do that. And so Alice sends Carol 10,000 Satoshis, and Carol says, great, I'm going to close our, uh, our, our channel and uh, go and you know, live rich on the, uh, one of the five bucks that, that she just cheated Alice out of. Um, so that, that's not trustless. How do we do this trustlessly? How do we set up this chain in a way that you can make an atomic payment between two people that don't have a channel together? Uh, hash time lock contracts are the first solution to that. There's, there's also a point time lock contracts that are made possible through Taproot, but I'm not really going to touch on that stuff. We're going to focus on hash time lock contracts. The, the, the basic idea with this is that it creates an escrow. So uh, you say that you want to make this payment, and you set the terms for how that payment actually happens. Um, so when we modify our commitment transaction, uh, we are not directly taking that 10,000 from Alice and giving it to Carol right away. We're creating another output. So we have the, uh, the commitment transaction, and then we have, oh, no, so this is our, our initial state. Where did, my, where did my HDLC side glow? There we go, okay. So when we make our hash time lock transaction, then uh, you can see we have our you know, two of two multi-sig that we're spending. Alice has you know, her balance minus whatever she's trying to pay. Carol has her balance. And then they have this other set, which Carol can spend if she knows the secret pre-image R, um, which only Bob has. And Alice can spend it on a delay. So if you know, the payment doesn't go through, if Carol disappears, Alice can still get her money back. So here's our initial state. Uh, the commitment transactions for Alice and Carol and for Carol and Bob. And you can see that we're just going 50-50. They each have the same amount of funds in each. Carol has a total of 100,000 Satoshis. Alice has 50. Bob has 50. And we want to transfer 10 of Alice's to Bob. So the first step is uh, called an invoice. So Bob creates an invoice. He comes up with a secret number we're calling R. And part of what is in the invoice is the hash of R. So still, only Bob knows R, but he's provided a way for anyone to prove that they also know R, right? Because you know, if, if you hash a number, you get you know, a completely unpredictable number out. But if you hash the same number, you get the exact same unpredictable number. And so if you want to prove that you know something without revealing what it is, you hash it, you publish the hash. And then if you want to prove that you know it, then you can say, put this out here. And everybody can verify that that is indeed the hash of R. So Bob sends that to Alice with a bunch of other complicated information that helps them figure out how to, how to route stuff to, uh, to Bob. And so uh, Alice 
talks to Carol and says, hey, I'm trying to send this to Bob. You are a hop on my route. Let's set up a hash time lock contract. And so they modify their commitment transaction with this little escrow output. So once Carol has R, then she can spend that 10,000 sats. Uh, or if that doesn't happen for whatever reason and the delay runs out, then Alice can just claim it back. So second step is go through the chain and create hash time lock contracts for each of the connections. So Alice and Carol have a hash time lock contract for 10,000 sats. Carol and Bob have a hash time lock contract for 1,000 sat, uh, 10,000 sats. Um, and again, we are, we are ignoring fees right now. So technically, these would not all be exactly the quantity that's being sent. You would send a little more to Carol, and Carol would send a little less to Bob um, and just take that as a cut. But we're keeping it simple. So uh, each one of these. Once the hash R is revealed, then they can consolidate those back into a normal commitment transaction. And so that's what we're going to do next. Once the chain of hash time lock contracts has been made all the way to Bob, then Bob gives Carol R. Now that Carol has R, if she wanted to publish that commitment transaction and claim the output, then she could. But it's a little easier to keep the channel open and just say, OK, great. I have R now. Can we go ahead and make our, you know, uh, consolidate our commitment transaction back to the simple version? Um, and then once that's done and Carol is guaranteed her funds, she can say, OK, now I have R. I want to I want to claim that from you, Alice. And so they update theirs to consolidate back down to a regular commitment transaction. And so our updated state looks something like this, that Alice has 40,000, Carol has 60,000 in that channel and 40,000 in the other channel. So she still has her 100,000 sats. And Bob is 10,000 sats richer because we made that transfer all the way through the network. So how does it look when we're not just working with this you know, dinky little system? Um, we have this whole network here. And we're going to say that Alice is trying to send funds to Frank. And uh, we're going to skim over so many routing details right now. But the basic idea is that they figure out through the gossip network how, what, what sort of route, depending on what fees there are in what channels, like what's going to be the most efficient route to take to send uh, funds from Alice to Frank. Now, when this actually goes through, if we just do it like hey, this, everybody can see that Alice is paying Frank. And that's terrible for privacy. You know, one of, one of the, the things that you can do off chain is you're not committing something to public view like you are when you make a Bitcoin transaction on chain. Uh, we actually have the opportunity to do this somewhat more privately. And so the way the information is propagated through this network, uh, they actually use a form of uh, onion encryption called Sphinx, so that at each stage, each of the nodes only sees who they are getting funds from and who they are sending them to. So Bob only knows that he's moving stuff from Alice to Eve. Eve only knows she's moving from Bob to Dan. Dan only knows he's moving from Eve to Frank. And only Alice and Frank know that they are the endpoints of this. Which again, it's a little more complicated than that because the invoice includes Frank's public key. So there, there are flaws in the system. It is not a you know perfect, impenetrable wall of privacy. But it's better than everybody literally knowing everything that everyone else is doing. Um, so uh, that is the basic idea, that we have this network of nodes that are connected with channels. And we have a means of figuring out routes through that and constructing trustless connections uh, that allow transfer of money instantly off chain between nodes. So let's, let's talk about what happens if you have payment failures. So remember what our hash time, time, lock, yeah, hash time lock contract looks like. So we have two ways that that can be spent. Either you have R, which means that it has reached the end and R is known, or there's a delay and it just reverts back to the person who's sending. So let's say we start this payment. Um, so Alice sends to Bob, Bob sends to Eve, Eve sends to Dan, Dan sends to Frank. Frank gives Dan R. Dan tries to talk to Eve, and Eve has disappeared. So how are we going to route back? Dan doesn't know that Bob is the next hop. You know, we've, we've got you know, that much privacy. So how do we make sure that this actually gets you know, finished up? Well, that's what the hash time lock contract is for. If Eve disappears in the middle of this, then it ends up that Dan is uh, 
going to be able to redeem what she sent because he has R now, right? That was the output that goes to him. Bob is waiting for Eve to send him R. Um, or no, Eve, Eve would need R. Bob, Bob is waiting for Eve to close things out. And he just waits out the delay, and Eve is gone. And so he's like, well, I guess I'll just take that back. And same with Alice, she just takes it back. And so if Eve disappears in the middle of it, it ends up that Eve actually pays Frank. But you know, we're not creating any money. We're not destroying any money. You want to stay up because you, know, you don't want to be the one paying for the chain. But you can see that it doesn't impact anyone else um, negatively. Frank gets the money that he needs. Alice is like, oh, OK, I got a refund. That's great. But you know, it came from Eve. Or let's say you know, we're, we're sending it, and Eve disappears. We, we have our route. Bob you know, tries to set something up with Eve, and uh, she's not there. Then you know, Alice doesn't end up making the payment. You know, there's, there's no R to be had. They just wait out the delay, and then they can close out the time lock contract when you know, the, the delay ends. So it's resilient to people dropping out in the middle. Um, it means that either it goes through completely or it fails. And there's, there's no weird in-between state that you end up with, you know, Eve actually getting paid the money that was going to Frank. So, yeah. on the event that Eve drops in the middle, yeah. if I understood correctly, the transaction will revert and never happen. So Alice will never No, no, no. Well, uh, so it depends on when that happens. If it makes it through to Frank, then the transaction did go through. Frank got paid. If Eve drops out as R is being propagated back through the system, then uh, you know, she ends up paying. Although, if what Dan does, he publishes his transaction to the blockchain, which includes R. R is going to be visible in his uh, unlock script. So if Bob recognizes that, that, you know, oh, hey, I recognize that hash time lock contract, that you know, it's, it's the same hash of R all through the chain, which is different for point time lock contracts. That's important for privacy reasons. But with hash time lock contracts, everybody has the same secret. And if somebody uh, publishes one of them to the chain, everybody along the chain can see, oh, I recognize that hash. That must be the pre-image for it. I can go ahead and claim that. But that only happens if Frank has gotten the money. It only happens if the payment went through. There is no way that anyone earlier in the chain can go ahead and just like claim the payment for themselves. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Is there some way to visualize this with the actual production lightning network so that Sarah could look at this graph and say, well, I see everything's going through Bob instead of through me. If I'm going to lower my fees by like 0.02%. Uh, well, so the problem is that you know privacy is a priority, and so if you're not part of this chain, then you can't necessarily see. You know, I, I, people do publish their fee rates because that's how routing happens. Um, so she can't necessarily see who is getting more traffic. Okay. Um, there might be some you know super technical way to use timing to fire stuff off. Like I, I'm not going to get into the weeds on that, but. Um, in general, you don't know what activity is happening on the network that you're not involved in. And you know, I'm perfectly fine with that. But you can see what other people are charging, and you can say, OK, well, I can guess that I'm probably missing out on traffic because I'm charging way too much. And so then I can you know, lower what I'm charging. Which, you know, given that we have this route that takes more hops than there actually need to be, if we just you know, go Alice to Carol to Grace to Frank, that's a shorter chain. I'm going to guess that Carol and Grace probably have a very expensive channel in there. And so everybody's just like, we're just going to route around them. They'll figure it out eventually. But that's, that's the, the joy of having a you know, distributed network is you're not locked into a single path. Um, and uh, actually, multi-path payments are a thing, too. I'm not going to get into that. But it doesn't have to be a single route. It can actually split up the payment. If it's a fairly large payment and you don't have enough liquidity along the route, then you can split it up and send it a couple different ways. And uh, that helps. So ways to use Lightning. You can run your own node. If you want to be super self-sovereign and uh, you've got some technical know-how, then it is possible. There are actually you know, a lot more tools now than there were at one point to uh, you know, set up a node and automatically manage channels. So that's not actually something that you need to think about. Um, you own your own money. You can negotiate your own fee rates. You can route your own payments. Uh, that's great. 
Cons are it is full control. You are responsible for everything that happens. You need to make sure that your node stays up. Uh, I mentioned watchtowers. If you're running your own node, it's really important to have a watchtower somewhere else so that if you know the network connection to your node goes down, then uh, your channel partners can't, still can't cheat. Um, so you have, you know, whether it's a watchtower that you run or uh, another service, which right now most watchtowers are altruistic. They don't actually charge fees for the service. Uh, I can't imagine that that's going to be that way forever, but right now there's some good people out there who just say, we want to make sure this works. And so, you know, uh, there's, there's a, gets a little bit complicated, but a way that you can Every time you update a commitment transaction, you can update your watchtower to say, you know, here is part of the transaction ID that we're doing, and here's a way that you can decrypt this information if you can get the rest of the transaction ID, which is only going to happen if they actually publish it on chain. And so if they, you know, try to cheat the system and publish an old transaction on chain, the watchtower recognizes that, and yeah, what's up? Uh, they don't have to be big. It depends on the scale of routing that you want to do. Like, you know, people are doing this out of server farms. People are doing this out of, you know, uh, Amazon, you know, uh, AWS. Uh, you can actually, so at the bottom here, we've got uh, some options for if you wanted to do that. Umbral and Rasblitz are both uh, basically Raspberry Pi. You know, same as a, a regular node. Like, uh, if you have an Umbral, that, if you're running a node at home with an Umbral, you probably have the option to set up a Lightning node on that. Um, so if you're not going to do like really heavy routing, then it doesn't take much at all. Uh, Zeus is the actual wallet that I would recommend using. If you run your own node, you can connect to it and manage stuff from your phone. Um, and uh, it's, it's pretty great for that. They, they also, they're going to come up on a later slide too because they do more than that, but uh, they're pretty cool. Uh, so yeah, if, if you want to run your own node, it's, it's not a huge investment. It's just a lot of technical things you need to keep track of, and uh, uptime is very important. Because unlike Bitcoin nodes, where you can send a payment, you can receive a payment, you, know, you don't have to be online to receive a payment on Bitcoin because it's just paying to an address that you control. And it just has to be confirmed on chain, and it doesn't matter if you run a node or not, it doesn't matter if your node is up or not, it gets confirmed to chain. When you want to spend it, it'll be there. Since Lightning nodes have these active connections that need to be managed, they actually do need to be up in order to receive payments. You know, when you're doing an updated commitment transaction, you can't do that offline. Like, you have to be connected to your channel partners in order to do that. So, uptime is really, really, really important if you're going to run a Lightning node. So, uh, how long does it take? So, you have, you have the, the, the graphic up there with yeah. five different or eight different names. Mm -hmm. It takes two seconds, 10 seconds? It, it varies, like depends on connection speeds, but it is effectively instant. It's, it's basically, you know, making a payment to somebody on PayPal or Venmo or Cash App. Like it's, so is, you send the money and it goes through. What does somebody have to do to make, to allow it? If somebody has to pay attention, if somebody has to look at the screen and do something. Well, so when, when I say you have to do it, your wallet has to do it. Like, you don't have to literally like go in and manage these transactions yourselves. If you have a Lightning wallet, it's handling all that in the background. You know, you say, I want to create an invoice. And, you know, they scan the invoice and they hit send and it shows up on your phone. That's, that's as complicated as it gets for you as you're actually using it. Um, so, yeah, now we're to the, uh, and uh, this, this one got Popper Bear here. This one's a little too hard, maybe. Works for some people, a little too hard for me. A uh, custodial lightning service provider is another option. That is basically somebody else does literally everything. You have a credit with their system saying how much money you have, and they do all of the routing, all of the management. You don't actually control your keys, so technically speaking, you don't actually own that Bitcoin. And we're back into a sort of trust relationship, which, you know, how many trust relationships do we have with banks and PayPal and Venmo and everybody? Like, that's. That's something that people do, but it's kind of defeating the purpose to me. Um, you don't have to do any of the technical management. Uh, you have a higher anonymity set outside of the LSP, so the LSP can see all of the payments that you make and receive because they're managing all that. But outside of that, you know, if you're using Strike or Wallet of Satoshi, then somebody who is you know, doing whatever they need to, to hack the system and see exactly what payments are going where, they can see that there's payments routing into Wallet of Satoshi or you know, Strike. And they don't know who it's going to inside of there. And they have a whole bunch of users. And so there's no way to tell that it's actually you that it's going to. Um, 
So there are, you know, some trade-offs there. Uh, the con's the big one, you don't actually own it. Um, which to me kind of takes the wind out of the sails of, of using trustless network. But it is very convenient. There are some centralized features like lightning addresses. So instead of, you know, creating a invoice that somebody needs to scan, you literally have a, a, an address that looks like an email address. Like if you can, you can send money to tdnickel at strike.me and it shows up in my strike account. Like that's pretty convenient. Um, if you're using Noster, then most of the time people are using lightning addresses to zap people um, or receive zaps. And so you're probably gonna use a centralized uh, service for that, which if you have few enough funds in there that you, know, you don't mind if the company suddenly disappears and your money's gone, then you know, that's fine. You can do that. Um, LSP may have a higher fee rate because you are using a service. They are doing work for you. And uh, generally speaking, if you are not paying for something, you are the product. And in this case, you are actually the customer. So yeah, you're gonna, you're gonna have to pay a little more for what they're doing for you. Uh, many exchanges are effectively custodial Lightning service providers. If you withdraw from Coinbase over Lightning, then they're acting as a custodial Lightning service provider. Strike is custodial. If you have Cash App, you already have a Lightning wallet. You might need to, you know, click through some things into the Bitcoin section, but you know, you can send and receive Bitcoin from your Cash App um, already. It's already in there. Uh, Chivo is interesting. That's actually the uh, the the wallet in El Salvador where it is legal tender. And uh, there's part of me that loves that that makes it very easy for people. And there's part of me that says I would absolutely never use a government-run custodial Lightning service provider. But uh, from the people in El Salvador that I've chatted with, it sounds like most places, you know, it's, it's an interoperable thing. So you don't have to use Chivo. You can, you know, you can use Strike. You can run your own node and still send stuff because it's an open protocol. You don't have to use a particular app. Uh, and while it's Satoshi was a really popular one for a while, I haven't really tracked what happened since there was some news about it maybe not being allowed in the US and it got really fuzzy for a little bit and I just pulled everything out of there and I don't know. So maybe that's still a thing. Maybe it's not. I'm not sure. But that's that's the question with custodial services is you kind of need to pay attention. Is the company still going to be there? Uh, and this is maybe too soft. We got our mama bear here. So the one that for me is just right is non-custodial lightning service providers, um, which you control the keys to your own coins. You know, you can make a transaction on chain anytime you want and just move your stuff out and they can't do anything about it. Uh, Benefits of an LSP without giving up control of your money, they can do a lot of the management stuff for you. You know, I can use this without needing to make sure my node is always up, right? Um, cons, uh, you can't do some of the centralized benefits of a custodial service. Like, I don't think that lightning addresses are possible with a non-custodial service. They, they need to manage that. You can set up your lightning address if you're running your own node. If you basically, I think it's basically you have a, a website that you know, gets the query and generates an invoice. That's what's happening under the hood. And you can set that up yourself if you want to. I'm not going to bother with that. Um, so yeah, there are, there are trade-offs. Uh, I use Phoenix most. Um, I really like that one. It, it sort of blends the on-chain and lightning into one balance. And so you don't need to think about uh, how much do I have allocated to lightning? How much do I have allocated on-chain? You can just say, this is what I have in my wallet. If I want to send and receive on Lightning or on Chain, I can just do that without needing to, you know, figure out any of that stuff. Uh, Zeus, I know you use Zeus, right? How how are you liking that? Uh, I use it with the custodial provider. So, okay. Uh, well, so like, fine. from from what I've heard, they they do have an option that you can basically use them as a non-custodial Lightning service provider. Is that right, or did I get that wrong? So they, you can actually run the Lightning node on your phone. Okay, great. I don't know if that's what this is or not. But when yeah, that sounds different. Phone, basically, you can only send or receive when you have the app open. So it's fine if you meet someone in person, you know, like scan my QR code, I'll scan yours, whatever. That's fine. But if you want to just like sit here and chill and be like, well, I hope someone uh, sends me some money for a donation, like that's just not going to work. You need yeah. Something else. You know what? I think I did see something that they do have like a delay built in that a lot of people were mad about because it, it creates these hash time lock contracts that you have funds locked up that are then sitting around waiting for the node to come back online to finish the payment. Mm -hmm. And people are like, you know, that's that's kind of bad practice. If you're going to sit there and wait for this to come back, you know, it should just fail. Yeah, um, a lot of controversy about force closes. Yeah. That seemed to be somehow related to Zeus. Sure. Yeah. Really clear to me. 
Well, as, as you can hear, there's a lot of stuff going on in the space. Um, there are a lot of different ways that you can use it. There are a lot of different implementations, a lot of different choices on how you actually want to interact with the system. Uh, Mutiny is another one fun one. That's, uh, I think it's uh, browser-based, actually. But that is another non-custodial, basically using their service. And they make uh, privacy a big priority. They use uh, what's called uh, blinded paths. So they don't actually know your full route. Um, which is, you know, that's pretty cool. But uh, yeah, if you just want to keep it simple, I really like Phoenix. That's, that's, that's my easy recommendation. Uh, so yeah, questions? With the middle ground there on the last slide. Yeah. Is some other or, service running a lightning node on your behalf? Like you're not running your own full node? They're, they're running their own node, and they have essentially a channel with you okay. that you can you can basically sign stuff, but you're not managing the actual anything. Yeah. So that's kind of similar to having your own node and then just sweeping it from a custodial. Yeah. Yeah. Kind of. So you um, explain it transactions that, um, or channels that yeah. starts with uh, known nodes and also available funds. You also mentioned that there is a, a non-equal parts that somebody has certain money and the other one doesn't have. Do you have a, a little explanation for that? So like you're, you're wanting to open a channel with someone and it's not 50-50? Is that what you're saying? Yes. So yeah, OK. Say I'm new and uh, I just joined. Yeah, so inbound liquidity, that's, that's called inbound liquidity. You say, hey, I would love to be able to receive funds on Lightning, which means you need somebody to commit funds to a channel with you. And uh, there are actually, there's, there's a, a AM boss, I think, is a, there's actually a market for getting inbound liquidity if you want to you know, set up your own node, run your own node, and then get inbound liquidity from other people. Um, if you're just setting up a node to send payments, then it's a lot easier because you can just say, hey, I have this uh, UTXO that I want to turn into a channel with you. And they say, oh, yeah, cool. OK, come on. Let's, let's make a transaction. And they don't actually need to commit any funds to that yet because you know, it's, it's all you. It's a, a single funded transaction, which is, is much more common than the dual funded we use in the, as an example. But yeah, so uh, inbound liquidity is an issue that you need to deal with if you're running your own node. Inbound liquidity. Yep. How does it channel is initially established? So that is this guy here. So if you want to initially establish a channel, then you know nodes talk to each other. There's a whole protocol for it. Uh, they decide that they want to create this, and so they make their commitment transaction first, um, so that they have, you know, they're both guaranteed that their funds are not going to be locked up in something that they can't spend. And once they have their commitment transaction finalized and signed, then they're going to make the transaction that actually the uh, commitment transaction spends the output from. right? And that's the one that they commit to chain. And so this funding transaction actually gets published. My uh, very fancy color coding, it's orange because it's actually locked on chain. And blue is potentially could be sent. Um, and so when you're opening a channel, like you're basically saying, here, let's, let's set up our contract first. That you know, whatever output we end up making together, this two of two multi-sig wallet, we're going to show how that can be spent. And once we both know that we can spend our funds, then we're going to set up the one that actually sets up the wallet and publish that one on chain. Um, that's the technical part of it. Thank you so much for it. Yeah. Uh, how does it look like in real life? Say I have a family member on the distance from here. Sure. How do we start the communication? We got the wallets, and maybe let's say I have some funds already. Gonna skip the part that how do I get the funds in there? But let's say I have some funds and I want to start. It. Sure, you you want to open a channel with someone in particular. With someone in particular. Yeah, I, it's probably just sending a QR code, scanning it. Like it's it's just a, a communication between the nodes, and there are all kinds of different ways that you can make that happen. I don't want to get into the weeds on the exact protocol, right, right. but it's it's like on on your end, you don't need to manage any of that. Like it's it's a fairly simple. You know, you want to open a channel, send the request. All the information needed is going to be included in that. You two work that out. They just they say yes, I want this, and then you know your wallet manages all the rest. Now let's bring that one more level of complexity. Say that I don't have a direct channel with that person, mm -hmm. the family member. How does the complex route get established? Okay, I I don't feel equipped to really describe exactly how the routing is calculated, but it's 
you know, it's 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 a graph. You know, you have you have published nodes and channels and the fees on those. And so then you just throw that into a, you know, we're just going to say you throw it in an algorithm. Algorithm finds the best route given where you know nodes are, what connections there are. You want to find the least expensive or fastest or whatever you're optimizing for. Um, and again, that's all under the hood. So you just jump in and then you advertise that you can work as a, a routing node. Mm -hmm. You're OK. And your transaction fee is 0 0.02, whatever. Yeah. And uh, here I am. If you want to send something and I'm close to another node, just use me. Basically, right? Something like that. You could, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I, I ran a node for a little bit, and it was a huge pain, and I was not using it enough to make it worth it. And I was not making any money off of the very few transactions that went through. So, you know, I gave up on that. But uh, yeah, so basically, the, the, the question of like, who do I connect to is a big one. Like that was that was probably the, the thing that was most confusing for me is like I can look up these lists of published nodes and see who's connected to who, but like who do I send these requests to? And that's that's what something like CL Boss is really good for. It's a uh, uh, CL Boss. It's uh, so uh, C Lightning is one of the implementations. And so if you're using a C Lightning node, then there's a program called CL Boss that actually does channel management for you. And like we're not even getting into like rebalancing channels. If you know you make a bunch of payments in one direction, it gets super unbalanced and you can't send in that direction anymore. And so there's there's all kinds of levels to this that we're just skipping right over. Um, but something like CL Boss helps automate that. And I think that having tools like that is going to make it a whole lot easier for people to run their own nodes. It's not going to get around the problem of uptime. But you know we have watchtowers for that, and as long as you know that you are up when payments are coming in, that's okay. But there are also, uh, if you want to like you know have a website up that you're taking donations, there's a company called Open Node that you know I think they have like a WordPress plugin, literally, like it's super easy. There's also a BTC server that lets you do somewhat more autonomously. I don't remember the details exactly, but there are a lot of tools out there if you're interested in doing that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Which are the major and most important So the, the three biggest off the top of my head, C Lightning, I think is the second. Most of them are LND. Um, and then the third place is Eclair. Um, and I know that Phoenix uses Eclair. I don't remember who the companies are behind C Lightning. Like I think Blockstream maybe does C Lightning. I don't remember off the top of my head. But uh, I think I think they're all open source, um, but yeah, there there are options if you you know want to research which what each of them can actually do. Uh, there are some differences at the the fringe, you know, the cutting edge new stuff that people are working on. Uh, but in terms of just like you know you want to do basic payments like this, they all support that. Any other questions? Yeah. So I two two things. And one is this was an interesting conversation here because. I couldn't figure out, is Alice, does Alice and Bob, they could represent two individual people, Alice and Bob. Mm -hmm. Bob could be the guy that changes money in a country and gives you a better rate than the bank next door. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Uh, I mean, Bob could be anyone. But he could be a business. He could be a business, yeah. Okay. And a lot of these nodes are businesses. Okay. Like, large-scale nodes actually do a whole lot of routing, and there are fees involved. So you know, they're making money that's not a lot of money, because you know, they're, it's an open market, and a lot of people are willing to do it for very, very little. So it's, it's fairly competitive. But there, there are large-scale businesses that have a whole lot of liquidity that they have committed to Lightning, and they actually run things like that, yeah. So uh, to some extent, Venmo and Zelle do this at a level involve banks, PayPal obviously on Venmo, so there's yeah. a whole lot of stuff that goes working with either Venmo or Zelle. Mm -hmm. And this gets around that. It's a protocol that they could all talk to each other. One of the things that really annoys me about Venmo is they do have Bitcoin support, but they don't support Lightning. Like I, I don't know how in 2024 you don't support Lightning. It's weird. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. No, <laughs> get with it. It's it's an open competitor that anybody can use, and so they're just going to do a worse job than their competitor. Cash App does Lightning, and so if you're going to use Cash App, then you can do instant payments through Bitcoin and Venmo. You can't. That's that's the difference that I see. Unfortunately, they're running the industry on on top of the ignorance of people. Sure. The great thing about ignorance is it decreases over time. Over time, give it time. That's it. Over time, they can make. Yeah. Uh, so at some point, that network can look more um, like a 
a star. If you're a very consistent, low latency network with enough funding, then it will look more like a star. Yeah, yeah, there are centralizing forces if you are a exactly. very large scale node. Rather than a DAG yeah. by itself, which would mean that everybody's a little more involved and they know what's going on, so they know how to use it. Yeah. The, the, the great part, though, is since it is an open protocol, there is, it's, it's basically a check on those centralizing forces. You can make it, you know, you have a big, huge liquidity node that starts charging way too much, and people can just start routing around it. That's easy. So now you brought another topic, which is very interesting, liquidity. Mm -hmm. um, so is that liquidity jumping off of, for lack of a better description, off of the... Um, Bitcoin network into the Lightning network and residing there until it's fully committed, or it's just like a shadow of what's going on? It's, it's a shadow. It, like, all of the funds are on chain. Like, you make this commitment transaction, you know, those uh, unspent outputs that are inputs into this, you know, that they are, they are committed to this particular output. And Everything that happens inside the channel is just deciding where is that two of two output going to be spent. And until you actually commit one of your commitment transactions to chain, then that is just a UTXO that could be spent. You're just working out the details with your channel partner of, you know, how is it that we are going to spend this money that we both control when we actually spend it on chain? And that's what a channel closes. Can you quickly touch base on, uh, on the concepts of Unspent versus spent. Yeah, so. That relates to both networks. Yeah, yeah well, so, so here, Alice and Bob each have a 50,000 sat UTXO that they want to come together on here. As soon as this funding transaction is committed to chain, those UTXOs are now spent. They are used as an input in a transaction that has been committed to chain and they can't be spent anymore. It's, you know, the, the reason that there's a blockchain to begin with right. is to prevent the double spend problem. Right. So, so the commitment or the negotiation happens in the Lightning Network, knowing that there's X amount of Satoshi living on the blockchain network. Mm -hmm. And once this is finalized and actually committed, then that process of spending happens. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So once, once you have the channel, then all you need to do is update your commitment transactions and exchange revocation keys, and so only that most recent version is spendable. Now, bringing that concept or concepts into the possible centralization based on the power of the node. That yeah, yeah, yeah. The whole benefit of all that is actually having one single node that can actually make large transactions, avoiding extreme cost by centralizing all these commitments into one large that makes sense? I'm, I'm not sure, but I think, I think we're out of time. <laughs> well, sorry, so when, when you're talking about like the, the centralized node, you can do multipath payments. So you don't need those giant nodes in order to make large payments. Is that what you were asking? Not quite. OK. We'll talk about it. OK. All right, thank you all for coming. Really great questions. Thank you.